And uh, our third speaker is Magdalena Stalisz-Wolska, and the title of her talk is Reeducation, Denazification, Schuldfrage, Images of the Third Reich in the German Public Sphere, 1945-1949. Magdalena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, before I start my presentation, I'd like to add three points. The first one was that I realized that after I already submitted my paper, um, I, I realized that this title is quite misleading since I skipped the images of the Third Reich and focus on images which deal with its consequences. So now I would simply entitle it Coming to Terms with the, the Past in German Visual Culture in 1945-1949, maybe with a question mark in the end. And the second point is that, I, that since I represent the cultural studies, I deal with images and their possible meanings. So I will speak about visual symbolic representations of some aspect of Germany's transition after the Third Reich. And certainly law and institutions of justice do play an important role here, but uh, this is not my point. Uh, and the third point is that it is still a work in progress. I will present you some examples of images with a different attitude towards the Third Reich, its crimes and consequences, but actually I'm still, still working on, its, on the cate categorization. So I'm trying to look at both Western zones and the Soviet occupation zone, which is not easy but seems necessary to me, at least for the case of Berlin where people could move more or less freely between the sectors and since they used the same currency until 1948, they had good access to media from other sectors. The Allied, occupations of Germ Allied, uh, the Allied occupation of Germany after World War II permitted all spheres of social, political, and cultural life. Generally, one could argue that there were only a few direct images of national socialism in the German public sphere during the period from 1945 to 1949, which is not surprising, of course. Those pictures which were present hardly depicted Nazi crimes. There are yet many other images illustrating the impact and consequences of National Socialism. Above all, photographs and films collected during the liberation of the camps, and some of them were presented during the uh, Nuremberg trials in terms of evidence. Some areas of this research film field are, are already very well explored. This applies above all to the aforementioned images of the concentration camps, as well as to fiction films made between 1946 and 1949 in all four occupation zones. Nonetheless, there are three problems that to me appear to be insufficiently studied so far. The first one is the present presence of Nazi emblems, portraits, photographs or satirical images of prominent, Nazi, uh, prominent party members, among others in the reports from the military tribunals from, for the persecution of the Nazi leadership and perpetrators from the certain concentration camps. Being the main part of my argumentation, I will return to it in the following. The second problem is the domination of Christian symbols in Holocaust discourse. For reasons of time, I will not develop the topic further here, even though I would like to mention it. To give an example, when Hanusz Berger and Billy Wilder edited the film Death Mills from materials collected during the liberation of the camps, they showed long shots of Germans carrying crosses in a town near one of the camps. The film's poster also depicts a cross. The case of death mills is particularly interesting since both authors were Jewish and must have realized that most of the victims of the camps were not Christians. Yet the cross became the universal symbol of war and genocide victims, both in serials and satirical context. And a third problem is um, recalling national socialism in order to explain current programs such as ruins, hunger, diseases, or expulsion. In such pictures, Nazism was not, uh, was not visualized directly, and the notions Hitler, Nazism, or fascism merely supported contents which dealt with the situation after the war. Even though the two latter cases, so Christian symbols and recalling to Nazism in order to explain current programs, are highly interesting and deserve further research, in my analysis I will focus on images that represent, in very various contexts, either symbols of national socialism or portraits of prominent Nazis. 
I make use of diverse visual mass media, which were present in the German public sphere during the first years after the war. It means posters, press photographs, but only newspapers with a circulation of at least 100,000 copies, popular fiction films, newsreels, as well as banknotes or post stamps. And as for a general context, um, I have to add that in terms of quantity, images that had anything to do uh, with the Third Reich were just a small minority among all other pictures that were present in the whole public sphere after 1945. What was the institutional context and what's the current state of research? The legal act that basically regulated culture in occupied Germany was the so-called Act Number 191, which was signed by the Allies already in November uh, 1944. Among others, it prohibited the production and distribution of any printed materials. On the 12th of May 1945, the Allies signed its amendment, which implemented the license system. In practice, it meant that the permission to publish, print, produce, etc., depended on what the publishers or produce, producers had been doing in the Third Reich. Most commonly, members of the NSDAP or other organization like, organizations like the SA or SS were legally not allowed to work in the media. However, the control systems and the motivations were different in each occupation zone. Each zone had its own system of censorship, which again changed during the period between 1945 and 1949. While censorship in the Western zones was very strict during the first year after the war and was only being loosened after, later, in the Soviet occupation zone, it was rather light in the first months only. The three key notions that describe what we nowadays understand as gradual transition from, the, from national socialism to democracy or communism in the case of East Germany are re-education, denazification, and anti-fascism, the latter used specifically in the Soviet occupation zone and later in the GDR. The popular term Schuldfrage, so question of guilt, however, achieved its quasi-mythological status, as Jeffrey Olick called it, much, much later. The Western, mainly American, program of re-education and denazification first focused on convincing the Germans that they were collectively guilty. Hence, the American propaganda confronted the Germans with images of Nazi crimes as early as in April and May 1945. Since the mid-1990s, a considerable number of studies had been published on photographs and films collected during the liberation of the camps and presented in the German public sphere in the first uh, months after the war. In late uh, April 1945, the American army forced Germans from towns close to the former concentration camps to look at dead bodies of, of the victims. The American and British military governments printed posters and booklets with very drastic photographs and made special films from those materials, amongst others, the aforementioned death mills. The concept of collective guilt and, of, uh, and the official and omnipresent condemnation of National Socialism, too, failed to achieve their aims, mainly because most Germans did not believe in the collective guilt and responsibility of the whole nation. In 1946, the American re-education program underwent radical change and consequently focused on persuading the Germans about the American way of democracy and capitalism. Instead of the whole nation, only prominent members of the Nazi organizations were accused of war crimes now. This concept formed West Germany's coming to terms with the past in future decades. The popular slogan, Hitler was, so it was Hitler, meant that most Germans did not feel guilty. Some of them even considered themsel themselves to be victims. They were convinced that they had been seduced, seduced by a small group of Nazi celebrities who in turn were personally and solely responsible for the crimes. In terms of visual culture, this idea is expressed amongst others by a graphic by Werner Eggert. Uh, and uh, what you can read here means more or less, um, Führer ordered, we are suffering from the consequences. This argumentation was also very characteristic for many other cultural texts, such as novels, short stories, memoirs, or even feature fiction films made from 1945 to 1949 and after. The presence of Nazi emblems and celebrities. Although, the, although most images and narratives omitted any direct representation of National Socialism and the crimes of its uh, followers, 
Nazi emblems and portraits of prominent Nazis were very frequent in the public sphere, obviously usually in a negative context. Thus, the new systems had no iconoclastic relation to the old symbols unless they were presented in a positive way. I shall start with an example from everyday life. Until the currency reform in June 1948, the German population continued to use the old Reichsmark. During the three years between 1945 and 1948, the Germans paid with banknotes bearing the state emblem of an eagle holding a swastika. In the Soviet zone, these banknotes remained valid even longer. The Soviet administration needed more time to introduce the currency, so instead they put special stamps on the banknotes in order to mark the money after June 1948, which is what you can see on the slide, this stamp 5, 1948. Besides this interesting, albeit rather marginal example of banknotes, and Nazi emblems, as well as portraits of Hitler and other Nazi celebrities, were depicted primarily in a negative context. Many of those images was, were of satirical nature, which was due to at least two reasons. The first one was that ridiculing the old system helped establishing a new one, and the second one was that after 12, year, well, 12 years of dictatorship and total prohibition of laughing at Hitler and National Socialism, jokes answered to long-desired needs. Satirical drawings of particular or anonymous Nazis were printed in both West and East German press. Many of them portrayed the swastika as the main emblem of National Socialism. The examples below are from the daily newspaper Tägliche Rundschau, which was published by the Soviet administration. This picture was published already on uh, the 29th of May, 1940. Uh, five and depicts a wheelbarrow among ruins and graves. The wheelbarrow contains, contains the Führer's bust, a swastika flag, an edition of the daily, Nazi daily newspaper Völkische Beobachter. I, I'm not sure if you really can see it because it's a very bad copy, but um, it's there. Uh, there are also some photographs of, uh, or portraits of prominent Nazis and the Nazi eagle, so-called Reichsadler. The picture says, clean up, build up which is a clear metaphor for the failure of the old system. The new system, however, is not depicted on the visual level. The term build-up refers to the material structure of the destroyed cities rather than to the political system. And the second picture is of uh, later origin and was published by the end of the analyzed period on the 6th of March, 1949. It's a comment on the trial of the former American spy Kravchenko. The witnesses of defense who cooperated with Kravchenko and the American intelligence are presented as Nazis. It is a clear example of the development of the meaning of the Nazi symbols in the Soviet zone. In the very first months after the war, Nazi symbols simply accorded to the Third Reich. After the outbreak of the Cold War, however, other enemies of the Soviet Union were, present, were depicted as Nazis too. Many other interesting examples of Nazi symbols in satirical context were published in the two satirical magazines, Uhlenspiegel and The Simple. Both were licensed in the American zone and intentionally continued the satirical tradition of the Weimar Republic. Some of them just ridiculed the Third Reich, sometimes in a very grotesque way. Here you can see a picture by Günther Strupp, uh, published in April 1946 on the occasion of the Führer's birthday. Others, uh, like the two pictures uh, published in um, Der Simpel, shortly before, dealt with the aspects of Nazis hiding in the new society. Portraits of prominent members of the Nazi leadership were not only shown in satirical contexts. Many photographs were published on the occasion of the Nuremberg trials and other trials of certain concentration camp leaders. In these cases, the negative context was provided by the articles in which the trials and the crimes were presented. Sometimes, the photographs of the perpetrators were juxtaposed with photographs of the victims. Here you can see an article about the Buchenwald trial, written by survival and later novelist Egon Kogon, and published in the American license magazine Heute. The accused are depicted in very informal poses. They do not seem to be aware of the fact that they are being photographed. They are looking in different directions, they are talking to each other, only seven of them are wearing uniforms without any Nazi emblems. The photographs of the accused women in the Ravensbrück trial, here an example from the women's, magazine, um, women's weekly magazine Z, had a similar function. The women are presented in different poses, only two of them are looking into the camera, they bear numbers as prisoners in the concentration camps did, which, which was very common um, during the trials and other trials too. 
Analogical shots from the Ravensbrück trial were used in the American British newsreel Welt im Film. When comparing these photographs to the ones from Heute, we can notice two important differences. The first one is that each woman is presented on a separate photograph and named. They are not an impersonal mass of 31 perp perpetrators, as in the case of the Buchenwald trial mentioned above. The crimes are mentioned in the captions beneath the photographs, but are not visualized as in Heute. We see six particular perpetrators. What we do not see are the crimes. However, most readers of the magazine must have seen photographs from the concentration camps before, given that they were presented in the West German public sphere immediately after the war. Presenting the perpetrators by name and omitting pictures of the crimes supported the narrative of a few guilty Nazis and the innocent masses. The strategy of presenting the perpetrators as normal people who looked just, uh, just as every other German was not the only one to be used. Many other photographs of, from the reports from the trials used official old portraits from the Third Reich. Typic, typical examples are photographs of the accused in the first Nuremberg trial, published in the daily Die Welt, um, British Occupation Zone, uh, on the 4th of October 1946. We only see the accused faces and their different expressions. Some of them are wearing uniforms. These appear to be portraits that were used in the public sphere during the Nazi dictatorship. At least a few of them seem to be former photographs from passports or other former documents. On the one hand, it's an understandable strategy, since these Nazis were accused of crimes that had to committed in their formal official roles. On the other hand, though, these pictures do not imply any disapproval of their crimes. One could think that the, think that the licensed press in occupied Germany depicted prominent members of the Nazi leadership only as perpetrators or ridiculous figures. There are, there are some cases, however, where the negative context is not given. One of them is a portrait or series of portraits of Eva Braun in the magazine Z. She's presented as a rather innocent young woman than a committed Nazi. Amongst, uh, amongst other pictures, we see a private photograph from Eva Braun's sister's wedding. On the right hand side, there is Adolf Hitler, and um, on the Bottom right picture, no, bottom, bottom left picture, picture, you can see Hitler playing the piano. None of the captions mention anything really negative. Some of them are um, a bit ironical about Hitler, but not about Eva Braun. This is merely a photo essay, as it was published in the case of many other female celebrities. To sum up, the strategies of presenting Nazi emblems, as well as former prominent Nazis, were very diverse, especially in the Western zones. The two basic contexts in which they were presented were satirical drawings and photographs from the trials. Other than that, there were images like banknotes or photographs, as the ones of Eva Braun, but they do remain rather isolated cases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.